Welcome to The Fourth Watch. As the world is falling apart, the church should be coming together, but we have to wake up first. Biblical prophecy is unfolding and we keep looking for a new normal. The enemy is parading in broad daylight, we keep changing the channel. The media keeps saying look left, when the real activity is happening to the right. 2020 caught everyone off guard, which leads to one very important viewpoint. Every demonic influence running rampant in America right now had to go through the church to get here. It's time we changed our focus and our footing. No more excuses, no more racial divide, no more ignorance, and no more country club church. The enemy feels like he's on a winning streak, but we're here to remind him and you of our biblical and American heritage. We serve the Lord of Angel Armies, and we thrive when our backs are against the wall. The goal of the fourth watch is clear, to equip you with a biblical foundation as it relates to spiritual warfare. You don't need to be a pastor or a teacher to recognize what's happening, and the Bible is filled with references to the last days. History isn't repeating, it's setting the stage. One of our generations has to be the last, and no one is coming to save us but God. So how do we see things as he intended? How do we see the enemy at work in our daily lives? How do we respond to demonic attacks against ourselves and our family? How do we identify the deceivers masquerading as politicians, celebrities, influencers, and even pastors? And more importantly, how do we bring revival when most Christians are focused on culture over kingdom? The fourth watch is from 3 to 6 a.m. daily, the darkest hours before the dawn. It's when Abraham raised his dagger, when Jacob wrestled with God, when Peter stepped onto the water, and when Jesus arose the third day. Now, the fourth watch is our effort to show you how spiritual warfare isn't just real, it's raging. And whether you choose to see it or not, every single one of us has a role to play. Journey with us as we search the word, discuss current events, put our faith into action, and use ourselves as an example along the way. Welcome to Spiritual Warfare for the Masses. Welcome to the fourth watch. Yeah, testing. Testing one, two, live and direct. Testing. Am I supposed to talk again? At some point. All right. Okay. Saturday, July 13th, 2024, 11.49 in the morning. Welcome to the Fourth Watch. Welcome to the art show. Chisel, what was it called? Chisel, chisel and O? This is, this is the inaugural episode of Dr. O and the Chisel. Ibukin, Dr. Ibukin Oleg Bemi, my wife, and I'm Charlie, Charlie Arts, Chisel. <laughs> you can also talk to that camera, by the way. Dr. O and the Chisel uh, is kind of a... Something that came, I, I am convinced, through the Holy Spirit in a, uh, in, a, in a somewhat serious but somewhat joking atmosphere. But here we are, because we have both been given uh, word, revelation, knowledge, understanding, uh, prophetic gifts with, with a bukin, and, uh, and deeper and deeper understanding. And, and we are inundated with word, and uh, it's time to, to go. And, and by go, we're going to share. We are going to proclaim God's word. We're going to proclaim Jesus as Savior and King. And we are going to, uh, we're going to help set people free. Set people free. People who are in bondage, who think they're free, who listen to the lies of the world. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to love them enough to tell them the truth. We're going to bring Jesus' truth his perfect love, his perfect truth, and his perfect bi- fire in what we like to call balanced extremism. Balanced extremism, it's a beautiful paradox. First, I'd like to get Nabugan's confirmation. Are, are these all factual things? They are, so far. Thank you for that caveat, all right, counselor. And then during our wedding vows, uh, not too long ago, we just uh, we just got married. Uh, I inadvertently began to cross-examine Ibukin uh, <laughs> when I was supposed to be making my vows, but I tried to call her to remembrance, and I, I touched her hand. The Holy Spirit told me to put my hand on her forehead, kind of like this, and uh, and uh, I said that she had the Deborah anointing. So, so why don't you tell the folks about what that is, and we'll get into uh, some of the topics. The Deborah anointing. I mean... So this, these things, please understand that we, we have, we have, I have allowed the Lord to burn down all my pride. And when I see it, then I, it still comes back, of course, and I try to burn it down again. So when I say things that sound some type of way, as the kids say, it really is just in spiritual confidence. And, and Abukin is very humble, so 
when I said about the Dever anointing, you can say it, and everybody knows, they can see your eyes that you're humble. <laughs> so would you say that that's an indication of, the, of you know, a type of Debra anointing? It, it requires humility? In and of itself, it does. It also requires her to go out front, which I have no... Notwithstanding the fact that I've done 83.9% 80, of the speaking so far, it requires, compels her requires and compels her to go out front and I can take a side step and I have no trouble with that at all. No trouble with that at all. So with that, Abukin, would you like to talk now? By the way, we're all friends. We go back years. So, you know, if I interject and it seems like I'm being a little insensitive, I'm not. So I, I personally, this is definitely not God. This is my personal battle. I struggle with Words like that, things that sound like, not titles, but you know what I mean. I mean, Deborah was not a little deal. But it's also important that when God begins to speak to us on something, it's either you think it's too big or you think it's too little, and either of those is a lie. The truth is that your identity is shaped by God, and our, my most important and core identity is daughter of the most high god and what i do and what he calls me to do and whatever the big call is which contains the assignments and the tasks and the duties and what words those put on me i leave up to him so i don't i don't fight them but yes i i do struggle to talk about them the thing with the Deborah anointing is that God started to speak to me about the place of a an encourager, how she spoke to Barack, and the word that always comes up is just up. The way she went to Barack and said, up, let's go. She heard a word from God, and she had a, a post, a duty post that was Deborah's palm, and there's a lot of really cool, sim not symbolism, meaning to the palm tree, which I'm not going to go into. But that meant that she was in one place and she communed with God and she was a messenger of God. And people came to her all the time for different reasons. And so one of the messages she passed along that we know of was the message to Barak by which she spurred him on to help free Israel. So the, the job is complex yet simple. For me, I simplify it to what does God say and then say that. And then she also says, we focus on what matters to God in disregard what doesn't matter. Right. Don't spend a moment on it. What's cool about Deborah too is that she, you know, she spoke to Barack in a way it's like, listen, like, like, you should go. You should go and do this thing. And of course, he chose not to. He's like, I'm not going to go without you. Which, on one hand, is a tip of the hat to to her. On the other hand, though, it just it shows that there's honor there. Like always, like rightly placing honor where it's due. But um, ultimately, the work has to get done. And so it's it's kind of cool that you you know you take you two with your personalities, your backgrounds, your vocations, and it's just it's just an awesome fit. It's pretty cool. Our disasters. Yeah. And Shape. She experientially affected by disasters, but no longer victimized and no longer being subjected to a stronghold, which is also a function of freedom, is to recognize a stronghold, understand when it is uh, based on your own sin, based on someone else's sin against you, or based on what we might call an environmental sin, like racism or something like that. Those kind of sins that have occurred can and, and frequently do become strongholds. And unless you apply the punishing principle of 2 Corinthians 10, that, you know, the last element is, is to, is to it, it, the first element is to pull down a stronghold, demolish it. The second element is to cast down arguments that are contrary to God's word. The third element is to take captive 
all thoughts that are disobedient to Christ. And the fourth is to punish any disobedience. Now, that may be your own disobedience, but it may be some kind of external disobedience. But, but that, that stronghold recognition destruction is, is, is an important step in, in freedom. One more thing about Deborah before I move off it is she did what she had to do. The point was it was time to liberate Israel. That was the mandate. And a man does it, a woman does it. It just needs to get done. So she did what she had to do. She went with him. And I find that interesting because, well, she had a place to be and other people to serve. But this was the job of the moment, and she did what she had to do. So it's important not to be afraid to get into the fray sometimes if that is what needs to happen. How, how long have we known each other? So I think it goes back to 2021. It was a Tuesday night. It might have been 2020 when uh, we get kicked out of a church because we wanted to go to the church. And uh, so we ended up at Legacy Faith Church, and Steve showed up there, and I saw him two consecutive Tuesdays, and something drew me. It had to be like the Holy Spirit, um, because being the chisel, I am no small man, but this is a mountain of a man, a mountain of a human, but a, but a, but a Zion of a spirit man. Amen. So something attracted me to him, and I just went up and I said, who are you and what's your story? I don't know if you remember that, yeah. Steve, but I just went right to you. Super and direct. And super direct. it was super direct. And so it's been three or four years, and uh, you know, I've just sort of spent some time with Steve. I've, uh, I've fed him, and then uh, you know, that's feeding Steve is... Uh, <laughs> is actually the correct kind of uh, verb approach because I've seen the man house three T-bone steaks and then some of my son's chicken that he needed for dinner, for lunch the next day. Don't forget the cookies. The cookies. Is it Hannah's cookies? The yes. And, and so what we call that is watching Steve eat is, is the Prowse house. Prowse housing the food, as the kids say. <laughs> anyway, so I got to know, say it's been, what, three or four years, uh, and I've had this sense of uh, uh, respect, love, and like admiration because this man is completely sold out. So whatever he's doing in the fourth watch, um, we're all in, and uh, we support you. We love you, Steve and uh, Lacey. Um, if anybody who's listening has uh, is is a sports fan and they understand the concept of trading up. Um, Back in the days when Major League Baseball had 60, 62 rounds of the draft, Steve was like, I don't know, somewhere in the late 50th round, and Lacey is a 1-1. So that means first round, first pick. This is accurate. This and, is entirely uh, accurate. So he uh, he traded up big time. Amen. And he knows it, and amen. And then amen. you're always protected. You need to know that. So that's, uh, that's our background. And then watching Steve do uh, – uh, this is a really funny story. The first time I actually heard Steve speak was at uh, at a men's group at our church. It's called Forge, and he came in there talking spiritual warfare concepts. and And, and I'm the guy that barely read the old, well, never read the Old Testament. I was under the mistaken, poor teaching that the Old Test that the New Testament superseded or replaced the Old Testament, and so it became irrelevant. No, I'm serious, and so I didn't read it. Right? I could show you. There's a little Bible over here. It just has hardly anything in it. Every once in a while, I go somewhere and somebody would speak on it. I have a couple things in there, but I didn't understand how it all fit together. Warfare, that doesn't make any sense to me um, because I came from a soft uh, brethren in Christ kind of church where you're just peaceniks. And, uh, and you know, you're kind of true to the word, but not, not, they, didn't, they failed to see the big picture. In any event, so Steve does this talk at the at the men's breakfast and he's talking about like taking the donkey's jawbone and cracking people you know and he's seeing a demon and wrestling with it and 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 crushing it and these kind of things and i invite not one not two i invite three separate people because i'm witnessing the word proclaiming jesus in the gym and wherever else i go so i bring these people mike you got to hear this guy speak they've never come back <laughs> they were so scared you know 
And one guy said, I, I, I didn't understand him. I didn't, I'm, I'm like, and he's a doctor. I'm like, yes, you do. There's, you, you can understand him. You're just, you're just A, fear, B, misunderstood, and C, just you're soft. And, and I'm, okay, go. It's okay. <laughs> And, and yeah. I'm, I'm okay not being, you know, for everyone. I'm not trying to be like, oh, hey, I'm going to try to He's not appeal. Paul. He is not the Apostle Paul. No, he's Steve. But that's anyway, it. that's our background. So so we've come to know you and love you and uh, and support you now with your with your work in New York City and uh, and anything on the fourth watch. And, and so we're all in. And what's happening to us is, is somewhat uh, the same thing that's happened to Steve and to Lacey. You know, we're newly married. Uh, we have a call. That we didn't go after. I don't, we don't want any titles. We don't want any positions. We don't want any recognition. All we know is there is a massive sense of urgency to bring God's word, Jesus' love, and the power of the Holy Spirit in. And, and I hope this catches on. I hope this becomes a thing with Fourth Watch people. Balanced extremism. Jesus' perfect love, perfect truth, and perfect fire. Read it. Read the word for yourself, and I guarantee you will find it. I am not making this up. This is this is a moderate Holy Spirit revelation. But when you see the whole, when you see the word together, you know, when you see it all fit together, then then the revelations come. And it's like uh, I say, it's like a uh, that movie, uh, natural uh, national treasure, when. They would finally get to a destination and hit the right combinations and the, there would be these keys that would unlock. And all of a sudden, whatever, the big treasure would show up or it'd be some door that would open or something like an Independence Hall in Philadelphia, click, 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 and all these things. I'm like, oh, that's where we found the glasses. That's what it's like when you're hungry for the word, when you dig in to the word, and, uh, and, and when you pray for and ask for revelation, understanding, uh, knowledge, wisdom um then you then you got to get it it's a spiritual law but i think you ask for them in the order of wisdom revelation knowledge and then understanding i think understanding is the deepest you can go as a, as a regular person but a bukin has the next layer higher and deeper which is discernment that is a gift so she has this discernment and we're going to let her, you can interview her a little bit about that. That's our connection. Uh, we're back together. Didn't see you guys for a long time, but always, God always brought in us contact. back. Always in contact. Always in contact. Yeah. Always Ran- in contact. Randomly. Yeah. Randomly, but, but also doc- orderly. Dr. Orderly. Dr. <laughs> discernment is, uh, discernment. yeah, she's Dr. Discernment. And, uh, and she says, I can't help it. I see the things. I'm like, that's discernment. That's that's even deeper than understanding, and that's what it's a it's a it's a treasure, a pleasure, and a privilege to be with a book. And because when she says the things, I say, why isn't anybody taping it? It's a beautiful thing. Like when when you have the burden, it's a beautiful burden because when you see things, and and God wants us inside churches to actually you know identify and witness these things, but. But like we talked about, there needs to be a pressure valve. You need to have something that kind of meters down the Holy Spirit to where, you know, you feel like you've honored God, you've honored the burden, but there still has to be action. Like God requires action. And the bottom line is the fear of God. You know, the fear of God is mentioned all over the Bible. When God notices someone, that's one of the things that he's looking at. When he mentioned Job, and he bragged about Job, kind of, to the devil, he said, he fears me. And it's not that God wants to be a holy terror to you. He wants you to be so concerned with pleasing him and honoring him that you, you literally put all your fiber into finding out what he wants and does not want, and you get in line. It's not a religious, doer-based thing where you get rewarded by doing those things. But it's because he's so precious to you that you do it, and he will meet you in that place and begin to bless you and use you. A lot of people ask God to use them. I used to wonder, oh, why aren't more people getting this, this prayer answered? Because we know that God wants to use us to do the things that need to be done for the kingdom. And 
it's in the fear of God. And he knows the people who fear him because it shows in how you make decisions, in what's important to you, or in the simple word of priorities. So discernment comes from the fear of God. I don't think it just drops on people. I think there's, there might be a word for that, which is witchcraft. But the discernment that we're talking about, that is about God into the things of God, which are the things that are eternal, that make a difference and shift things on earth and in heaven, that is Psalm 25. The secret, I think it's verse 12, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. And also, I think Isaiah 33 says, the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. <laughs> I love you're going into the fear of the Lord, though. I don't think that's talked about enough. And that it ties in with discernment. Well, what's you fix cool the too, light, babe. Fix, okay. fix her light. Yeah. What's cool, too, it's actually not talked about much with women. Like that's that's something that I've I've been acutely I've been made. Oh, can I look this up while we're not on? Yeah, of course. Because the a verse came to mind and I really want to get it right. The fear of man is a snare. It's also a curse, Jeremiah seventeen. Proverbs, yes. Proverbs twenty nine, twenty five. They think they're all that because they know the old testament, we see. <laughs> Just my- the word of God is one thing, Charles. Oh, that's funny. There we go. Dude. So. Dude, this is my first place. Look, this is the first time through I've gotten to write at Psalms. Look at all them notes I made. <laughs> right? People call it the scrolls, like the chisel Jeez. scrolls. I'm like, y'all, See, y'all. I mean, why would I need I'm the it? Old Testament person. I'm like, it's one word. There's, it's the same testament, testimony of people operating for God. Same author. Same. About the same. Person. Yeah, are it's, we are we back on? We're, oh yeah, we, we've been on the whole time. Okay, yeah, never stopped. So, by the way, name, rank, and occupation. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get. Name, rank, and occupation. What Char- are you talking about Char- Charlie Arts. Yeah. Also known as Satan to the to the to attorneys the, for the medical community for of, the uh, for for the insurance industry. Yeah, they think uh, they think I'm Satan when I catch them breaking the law, beat them, smash them, punish them. Pummel them, conquer them, <laughs> demolish them, pull down all their strongholds, identify their lies, expose all of their fraud, and then they call me the devil. But I'm okay with that because there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. What's your lawyer ID number arguing before the Supreme Court? My Supreme Court ID number, 55747. But I'm... Uh, are we I've editing won in that the Supreme out? Court. <laughs> I've had the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court lean in when I was done and say, "Excellent argument, Counsel." So that was that's kind of the pinnacle of uh, of litigation life. But that doesn't really matter. What that has done, like we talked with with Pastor David last night, what that has done is the Holy Spirit has shown me that understanding legal principles and construction. In other words, how do you read a law? The way you read a law is the same way you read the word, which is there are basic rules of construction and interpretation, and there are principles that apply. And and you have to give, the most important thing is to give meaning to every word. And it's called the rule against surplusage. Surplusage. Like, in other words, and that's right out of Deuteronomy, maybe eight, that says, this is the word that I've given you. Do not add Add to to it it or subtract from it. Do you see how, like, that's a principle. That's a legal legal principle principle that fits consistent with the word of law, word of God. And then there's a bunch of other legal principles that are completely contrary to the word of God. And, And what we're, I think what we're doing now is touching on some things that we will broadcast content. Because it'll be a Bukin's content, it'll be mine. Sometimes they're parallel. Sometimes they're sometimes they're just hers, and sometimes they're just mine. But there's a constitutional principle called a Miranda warning, and I bet everybody who's watching 
knows what it is. And Cop probably can recite it from watching Cop shows on TV. Can you, Lacey? Mm-hmm. What is it? Um, yeah, the right to you, remain silent. You have the right to remain silent. Everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. See that? See, everybody knows it. With, with no preparation, no prior cue. But then what, what we see is now in, in God's word, see... How many times are we called to make confessions? Well, confess so your sins can be healed. Confess so your sins can be healed. Confess Jesus' name. Con- you know, confess him in front of men, and he he will confess your name before the angels of God. And, right? and how you crazy see- is that too? Like your sins actually damage you. Yeah. So so in the law, confessing hurts you. In God's word, God's law. God's principles, Conf- failing to confess, like exercising your constitutional right not to confess, destroys you. You see, see the contrast. Oh, yeah. so sometimes there's things that are absolutely consistent with the law. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're completely inconsistent with the law. Anyway, before we uh, before we took off, there we were on fear, right? Ibuki. And this is this fear. is. A, Oh, this is a great juxtaposition because I've I've found probably just not not searching for it, just seeing it and writing it on my little notes. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Probably what twenty five times at least that I found. It's th- three hundred sixty five in the Bible. Three hundred sixty five Rich- in the Bible. Richard but, Wilbrand. But I, and, you know, I'm not. Th- this is how this is how the Lord shows me these things in in step, no matter where, where I'm reading. And then as I'm going through there, then he shows me the, the fear of the Lord. So it's kind of like a juxtaposition. It's a complete understanding. Like the world has the, the world that's blind and in bondage has no fear of God yet. They have fear of everything else to this day. When I go to the gym, I see people wearing a mask and working out, right? And that, that's madness. If you know anything about like working out, training, physiology, that's it's idiot. It's be it's it's stupid madness. They're just dumb. <coughs> They're just dumb. I mean, if they die, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do like mouth to mouth on them, or I'm not gonna call nine one. I'll witness to them, and because they need to they need to go because it's just too stupid to live, right? But I, anyway, I, fear, I, here's, here's I think phrase. we're gonna we might have to add it. That I, part, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna add to it. Some some people. We're not going to edit that. <laughs> He's going to add to it. Some, we're going to let him go. Some people's some people's reasons for living are just excuses not to die. Come on. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Where's my? I've been taking a lot of notes from this weekend, Lacey. Where's my pen? That's another good one. But Abu, can, this was important for you. Like, women don't like to think about fear, but is is that part of the problem? Is that? I mean, fear can actually be healthy. Fear can keep you. I, I've tried to teach, you know, and she's been picking up on situational awareness. She realizes that's my love language. That's one of them. And so, that's, you know. Uh, that's for not a thing. That is <laughs> yes, it is. That, there are only five. <laughs> okay. it's a, it's a See, thing. we have so many shows. <laughs> there are so many shows. I told that are you there weren't only five. So. <clears throat> but, like, she, her, even now when we have, like, little, our little update calls, like, hey, babe, you good? You know, she's going around New York City. She's like, yeah, you can be proud of me. I was sitting. I didn't have my back turned to anyone. Like, I was I was able to see everything. I had my hand on my flashlight, the knife. And I'm like, oh, it's like just a little hair on the back of my neck. Just go, I'm like, <laughs> this is love. That's love right there. It's beautiful, but but it's not done from a place of fear. Situational awareness is just an awareness of the fact that there are real risks and consequences, that there's a real order, and there's we live in a real world. And without that sense, like fear can be healthy, even though it's like, I, I joke around like God wired fear out of me, like God unlocked a new fear where it's like making sure that I equip you with as much understanding as possible of the world and how to mitigate risk. I believe that that's what the word of God does. It tells us how to mitigate risk. That's why fear is like a cornerstone of that risk. It's not just fear of like being attacked or killed, like, you know, we're, we're spiritual beings just temporarily housed. But fear that at any moment, God could actually snap our neck. And it's a beautiful thing because it's like, you know, a beautiful thing to be in the hands of a living God. Is that what mm-hmm. it is? Or a dreadful thing? Whatever, you know. I think it's beautiful. But what I, I always, 
I think so many women have an aversion just the idea of fear when it comes to God. And I'm like, it could be like one of the healthiest things. And there's a difference between expecting the worst to happen because that is living in fear. Any moment something bad could happen, then being prepared for almost the inevitable. And it's wise as serpents, innocent as doves. He has gifted us with um, minds capable of being prepared uh, with supernatural wisdom and knowledge. And the days that we're in, he's equipping us. And it's, um, it's, out of our own stupidity if we don't um, walk around prepared for something to happen. Yeah. And let me, uh, let me also address the, the, the beauty, the wonder, and the privilege of, of uh, being with a Bukin because she'll be talking while I'm lifting. Yeah, I'll be at the gym. She'll be at her house or, or walking around, and she'll start to say things that are revelations. And I, I make her stop and text them to me, or I stop and write them down. And then I go to my office and I shoot them into a Word file. And uh, and this is one of them, if, if you can see it on the camera. But this is the fear. This is the unhealthy fear. This is the hamstringing fear. Or do you want a book to read it? Fear is bondage. Fear binds you and deafens you, and you can't hear right. Mm-hmm. When you are fearful, you are vulnerable to manipulation. Fear is slavery. When you obey out of fear, rebellion is the end of it. When you obey out of love, strength, redemption, and honor are the end of it. Okay, that's, see, that's part wisdom. It's part revelation. It's part understanding, right? It's knowledge. But that's di- that's the level of discernment, right? And I document these things because I understand how powerful they are. You know, so that's the fear on the, she may not even remember, she probably remembers it because she doesn't forget anything. This is the good news and bad news. <laughs> this is the day of juxtaposition, right? The day of juxtaposition, you have you have extremes in the culture, right? And I have, and, and this is an example of an extreme circumstance. If you're with somebody that doesn't forget anything, what what an asset that is. Hey, do you remember it? Bam, bam, bam. It's like a computer. Just hit it, hit hit the search button, bam, here comes the data. But just go ahead and forget something yourself or do something wrong. You see, that's when. It's just accountability. What's wrong with okay, that? Okay, accountability is <laughs> vow number five. What she has done is put into vow number five, um, where this is broad accountability approach. Uh it's kind of like a, the Supreme Court used to call it the penumbra of rights. A penumbra <laughs> is actually a ghost. It's an apparition. If you look up the actual wow. meaning of the term, it's it's not a it's not a conglomeration. But she she creates this penumbra of 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 uh, uh, accountability. Mm-hmm. So anything I do or say can and will be used against me. <laughs> so the thing you were saying about fear and women. I had never thought about it, but I have now for the last few minutes. Um, so to me, what I've come to understand, I've asked God numerous times, teach me the fear of you. you teach me how to do that. Because you can hear a phrase and it, it sounds some type of way and you don't understand how to apply it and live it. And I just ask for it. And I'm learning all these different, very practical ways to know if you're operating in the fear of God or if you're not. And the bottom line is, if you're not fearing God, you're fearing men, usually. So that's why the Bible says the fear of God is it. The fear of men is a snare. It is a matter of time before you get tripped up when you put your fear of people over your fear of God. And a lot of the time people will say, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of anybody. But how do you make your decisions? When it comes down to it, every single time, do you make a decision based on what did God say? No matter what the, what's around you, what people are saying, what the majority, what the majority says. So I think with, with us women, we like to be, we like to be loved, protected, taken care of, but then there's this issue with being controlled and having to submit and things like that. And over the years and the generations, there's been a, a distrust of anything that's authoritative. 
and we immediately come up with bad names for it. But God himself actually says he is the one we are to fear and he's to be our dread. These are the words. And I looked up to see, well, what was the original Hebrew word? And no, it's dread. Yeah. It's dread. And that's because if, it's not because he wants you to think he's going to crush you. It's not about that because we know that he is good. He is good. We know he is compassionate. No, no being is kinder than God. But he says, fear me. Right. And that's a, another legal principle is, uh, is what we call the plain meaning rule. Like unless a term is expressly defined in a statute, courts will apply the, its plain and ordinary meaning. Right. So I've heard all the, oh, well, that doesn't mean fear. It just means reverence. You know, oh, it's reverence, God. No, no. And I, and I kept searching and searching and searching. And then you have to look at context. This is another statutory construction and interpretation principle. You have to look at a word in its context. You know, you can't ignore that. You can't let context eliminate any words in the rule of against surplusage, but you have to look at it in context. And every time I looked at fear in context, it meant it meant the real fear. It meant the dread that Abukin is just talking to. And uh and 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 that's that's one of the other things that we're gonna do. I don't know how we're gonna do it. We're leaning on you. We're we're asking you. We we just want every single church and every single pastor to function in balanced extremism. Stop adding. Stop subtracting. Speak every word. It's not hard. I have no Bible training at all. I have no Bible training at all, and I can out-preach 70% of the preachers that I've ever heard in my life. Well, then that, that leads me to a question. How much of God's people, percentage-wise, in the Bible had balanced extremism? I don't know if it was the high numbers that we would think. And so let's you say 70%, interesting number. So there's a sociologist that came out about, you know, 45, 50 years ago and basically said that 80% of society is incapable of complex problem solving as well as complex basically like the the deep things of intellectualism, which means they can only ponder and handle surface level activity conversations communication deep so that leaves 20 percent of the population to do critical thinking and biblically speaking right you've got percentages like jesus gives us the parable of of the 10 virgins with oil to five with and five without which it's that's those are believers who don't have the stuff by the time the master returns that's 50 percent of believers aren't going to have faith by the time jesus arrives like at any given time you could say <clears throat> Look at the seven churches. Only one of them, the Philadelphia church, 15% was doing just about everything right. Smyrna, you could add it as a second group. That that means the vast majority, and then, of course, the Laodicean church, right? You buy gold or find in my fire. That's f so at least one out of seven churches was sideways on, on the message. And so if you're asking pastors to step up with this balanced extremism, what is the reality of the numbers behind it? Because... <coughs> Balanced extremism doesn't result in the balanced budgets. <laughs> okay, so um, pastors, I love you guys. Uh, and, I, and I said this to one of my former pastors, and that's why he's probably my former pastor. And I said, dude, I said, I, I challenged him on, on why he shut the church down and why he listened to the imbeciles who were lying, who are clearly lying about things that were going on with COVID. And he said, you don't understand how hard my job is. And I said, what you don't understand is that this shouldn't be a job, mm. right? This Is this your calling or not? Are you there just on an occupation? Then, okay, but but I, I feel sorry for you. Get out and do something else, right? Or, or close the place because you're just, you're not, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, right? Possibly. The red lights on. Okay. And that was good. That was good. It was going really great, you guys. No, it's going this on. is what's fun, is you don't know what's going to come out. <clears throat> yeah, you don't know what's next. You don't next. know where God's going to breathe. And, and the cool part is, this is just like an introduction. Right. Yeah. Like, let, let God 
do what God does and basically God's introducing you guys. Whatever you guys like feel like the spirits leading you to talk about. Yeah. And that this just becomes like the segue into like the next thing. So right. on, sorry, the pastor says you don't know how hard this job is. Yeah, so I I mean we we all have to make money, but stop looking at it as a job, you know? Really, I'm just I'm just I'm not I'm not criticizing and and I've heard you know, my pastor criticized other churches without doing anything about it. Well, I want to do something about it. You know what? Here, here, let me tell you. If all the pastors in central Pennsylvania want to come and understand and and just open their hearts, open their minds with a go spirit, I will rent. I will pay every penny to rent the Harrisburg Senator Stadium. I will bring Dave Englehart. I will bring Steve Prowse. I'll bring Lacey. I'll bring a Bukin. I'll bring me and whoever else needs to come and encourage you guys to show you what it means to do balance extremism and go. Okay? We just came from a Methodist church where a Bukin sang and, the, and our worship was amazing. She sang three songs with a perfect pitch. And, and, and even their own worship, the old hymns were great, right? I really felt God's presence there. And then the word was, was, half baked you know it was half baked and and what i realized and all they were doing was talking about all these this stephen ministry right you would be offended steve by what the stephen ministry is it's 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 story stephen and acts but they stopped right before he proclaimed the gospel and got stoned and saw the heavens open and wouldn't stop proclaiming the gospel because he was filled he was full of power he was full of the holy spirit right he was full of God's grace, remember? I mean, those things are in there. And then one, once that hits you, it's like, yeah, when you're full of all that stuff, that's when you're going to go, right? But they stopped there and they talked about all these other things and some other guy talked and it was wonderful because of all they do. But you know what? They go really well. Food kitchens, food banks, um, clothing things, other kinds of need-based ministries, which are awesome. But if you go without the gospel, then you're nothing better than the United Way. You're just there to make yourself feel good. And, and, and it feel good. And you think you've done something, to, but, the, but it's works-based without, without the gospel. And then other people you know, go, go really, really wild and great and a word of faith and stuff, and then they just stay put, and they refuse to go. So that's the call. That, that is one of the things that we are crying out for and, and begging for in, uh, in these days, which might be the last days. So when he was talking about this Go Initiative stuff, I mean, where's, where's your heart, where's your spirit behind it? I look at it as everybody hears Go. That's certain. Everywhere I go, no matter what kind of church people are going to, even people who don't go to church hear it. But everyone's Go looks different and you almost have to find out for yourself what yours looks like. And I noticed that if people don't know where to go for the source or don't want to do the work, then they will try to fashion themselves after the person they want to most be like. But this is right. And why would that person tell you not to? it's a compliment and this is how we get hamstrung and trip each other up but the holy spirit jesus sent us the holy spirit to give us vision give us power and awaken the word that is in us from reading his word from what we hear when we pray from whatever we experience that god uses and he wastes nothing and what i see is The devil has succeeded largely in making God look like the bad guy. And people are now afraid of being filled with the Holy Spirit. They are disgusted with people who are because sometimes we do get weird. And people don't understand what we're doing. And sometimes really we shouldn't even be doing what we're doing, the way we're doing it. We can't blame reasonable people for looking at us and scratching their heads. But other times it's just people are afraid to cede control and lack the humility to say, I can't figure this out and I can't choose my own king. There is one king, there's one lawgiver, 
and it's Yahweh. Does that have anything to do, especially if there are women who can't kind of you know concede to that? Does that have anything to do with a lack of male leadership and faith? I mean, a man can lead financially, he can lead physically, he can lead you know by checking all the right boxes. But if you can't lead in faith, it kind of t- in my observation, it's lent itself to the dis ordination of the church right we're talking about order right like the orderly ways in which church goes so if you don't have that male hierarchy leadership where the man is driving at faith mm-hmm. is operating in the right faith is dying to self is dying for his his bride how how can you trust the church what in what environment can you actually trust a male-centered church to do things that the men in your life just haven't done and then worst how can you trust that god is actually up there as the ultimate male figure Exactly. When Sa- when David was dying, his last speech, he talked about when a man rules righteously. Yeah. What it looks like. And it was such a beautiful Second description. Yes. And it's, it's this thing. We are all supposed to have an image to look at. Your family should be your first idea of what roles should look like in the big world. And if a person is running the show, but not righteously, you have a tyrant. And if they're running it because God has called them and they are submitting to God and doing it righteously, then you have a leader who leads by inspiration. So a lot of families have father figures that are either absent or choose not to follow God or don't know how, and they become tyrants. So, of course, then there's rebellion, and it's this seed that becomes like a mold through society, and you keep cutting the bread, and there's still some. So people don't want to hear about a father, let alone a leader. (coughs) And so they reject that outright because, well, the last person I knew that was father was terrible. In fact, half the things that are wrong with me are his fault. That might be true, but that person will answer to God. But guess what? So will you. And your salvation doesn't come from them anyway, and God can heal the entire thing. About the fear of God versus the love of God, it's an interesting thing. I used to say to God, but perfect love casts out fear. Uh, I'm confused. Here's a simple thing God showed me. When you go to visit someone, at least when I go to visit someone, And Pastor David did that yesterday. He was getting ready to sit in a chair and he was halfway lowered and he said, can I sit here? And that's because a household usually has a dad. And a dad usually gets home from doing the things, you know, making the money, protecting, all that stuff. And then he has a favorite chair. It's usually positioned based on whatever interests him, the TV, the food, the AC, the kids, whatever it is. (laughs) But he tends to always sit in that chair. And without anyone really late, there's never, I've never walked into a house where there's a sign that says dad's chair. But somehow, if you're paying attention, you can tell the chair that no one else is going near it. And why would you? So that's a simple thing where you love your dad. But you kind of fear your dad to the point that not only would you not go sit there when he's home, you wouldn't let your friend who came to visit sit there. You'd be like, that's my dad's chair. So you love him, but you have a reverence for him. And the things that are his are not for common use. Mm. And people just want to have indiscriminate access because it makes them comfortable. But that familiarity in and of itself is unsafe because then you don't have any boundaries and you get into danger. Yeah. Because you're in the wrong kind of freedom. I wondered too if it's really good. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good. I and I, what's beautiful about that it's the difference of let's say the sin, and people think like, oh, I just I need to avoid sin so I don't get in trouble. But the the flip side of that is no, I I want to avoid sin because I want to honor my father, and it's just all of a sudden. But then, what, it's the difference between <clears throat> an obligation and and doing something out of out of love. It's 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 the system though by which you actually it's like what's your value system? Right. And so all of a sudden we realize we're surrounded by people who don't value honor and they don't value love. They just value and if anything like 
a, a transactional exchange. And that's that's the horrible reality that we've actually reduced our faith down to transaction. Like looking at Jesus like he's an ATM. And and all all <laughs> I've used I've used that same yeah. phrase. I love that. Yeah. And and it's it's so detrimental because that's how we teach our kids. And that's how we teach the next generations. And so if we wonder why the next generations, they can't pray, they can't, they don't know how to honor God, they don't know how to connect to a God that actually loves them. It's like, wait, it's because we failed to address the things and we thought all we had to do was just go to church, check the box, everything's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. And now we're realizing like, it was never about just checking the box. It was never, and so, but now we're in this situation where you guys, you know, again, like your kids raise them up to where they're going, but again, all kids think that they have more time. <laughs> and so right now, what's what we're realizing is that the enemy is coming so full speed, full send. The mistakes that previous generations had the you know luxury of, of, of experiencing, the next generation, this current generation of young people does not have. The things with fentanyl, with the drug use, where like in an instant, your life can be taken. Just by trying weed for the first time, it's laced with fentanyl. You don't know that. And so all, all of a sudden, all these things are going sideways. And what are the people of God doing? Nothing. They're still just doing just enough to get by for their life. And that's why the, the whole Go initiative, if we're talking about like, if you hear from God, you, you open yourself up to the point that you hear and receive burdens from God. There has to be a corresponding action. Right. There has to be. And, and one, of the, one of the great lies of the devil, the Holy Spirit uh, ex- exposed and revealed to me, was just getting by like depending on what your work is if it's physical work if it's intellectual work you just get by so you play i I realized i was just playing defense all day long for years just playing defense and being thankful enough for that and the holy spirit showed me taught me convinced me convicted me we said okay so your pitcher throws a perfect game the shortstop makes great plays. You make a diving catch, and then you jump over the wall in center field, Charlie, and you steal a home run from a guy. But you don't play any offense. What's the score? I'm like, it's zero, zero. Have you won? No. Do I, do, 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 do I overcome? Do I establish victory? Do I establish conquering? Do I establish you know, everything that's triumph in the word, in the spirit? Yeah. Well, that's time to play offense. I'm like, okay, well, show me. Right, and that's what—that's another thing for 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 your fourth watch listeners, right? It's it's time, guys. You know, we're not we're not yelling at you, you know, we're not being critical. We're just saying it's time to go to the next level because because the the devil knows his time is short, and the things that are happening in the world, particularly healthcare, right? Healthcare is kind of like the the place where all of the the worst and the newest things come. And this is where the war is. You know, it's just not, it's, it's not the drugs, but it's not just the drugs. It's like you, you can now have your doctor, um, the, the federal government right now thinks that it can mandate physicians to provide care so that your children will saw off the parts that God gave them and mutilate themselves. And that's a right. That's a right that they enjoy and a parent should do it. So, so where are we at? Where are we as a society? It's time to play offense, but we'll talk about that at another time uh, about what it really means to play offense in the spirit, right? The right balance again, balanced extremism, perfect love, perfect truth, and perfect fire. This is the fire part. This is the, when we when we go on the offense. You know, when we go on the offense, it's going to be perfect fire, and we're we're not going to sin. And be offensive. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna apply Jesus' model when, when the Bible said that Jesus was offensive, and that's when he dealt with tyranny, when he dealt with oppression, when he dealt with religion. He was, he brought fire against them and had no problem with offending them. And because everyone thinks we're supposed to like walk on eggshells for the majority of people, listen, if your ruler and authority and you're doing things wrong out of accord with the bible and against god just against people but especially god's people like at no point are we supposed to just appease that 
but that's what happens when we go along like we've created an idol of jesus that doesn't exist this go along get along jesus which is like wait why would we do that because we ourselves are are more in love with our likability when i say we like you know these quote-unquote christians Um, so it's okay. <clears throat> um, we're so in love with our likability that we don't allow the Holy Spirit to actually speak anything through us that could be somewhat life-changing. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. Just especially Courtney with the speaker right something. next to the microphone. It's just an accident. Yeah. It's fine. Um, I, if people don't go, what are they risking? If people don't speak up, what are they risking? And it's not like it's it's not just the risk of salvation, because again, like Revelation twenty one eight, who, what's the first group of people that that Jesus says don't enter heaven? Cow- cowards. Yeah, cowards. I mean, would you? Are, is it is it too much to lump these people into a box of cowardly? If you create a version and present a version of Jesus that doesn't exist, that's nothing but puppies and rainbows and love. Is that a, is it, because society doesn't want actual Jesus? They don't want vengeful, robe dipped in blood Jesus. They just want puppies and rainbows and hippie Jesus that doesn't exist. Yeah. And so, if pastors and other people within the church keep presenting a version of Jesus that doesn't exist, do they risk being called cowards? Oh, absolutely. And and I, uh, the Holy Spirit showed me that that one of the primary functions of my go is I want to know Jesus and the power of His resurrection. Maybe another whole, maybe another whole program to unpack that whole thing, but when you know him, you know you know his perfect love, you know his perfect truth, you know his perfect fire. But Christmas time for me is Revelation nineteen. It's Revelation one and Revelation nineteen. You know, ain't no little baby in a G, little baby Jesus in a manger. It's it's here he is, the resurrected Jesus with the fire in his eyes. And the sword of the spirit, the sword, the double-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth, which is which is the word. You know that's 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 what it brings. That's what it means to follow him. That's who we're following. That's who we know him. And when we know the power of his resurrection, like that is a game changer when you think about how you live and how you go. Because this soft image that he would love everybody. And that he would love somebody who shakes their fists and gives God the finger when when they're saying, you made me a homosexual? No, man, that's just a lie from the pit of hell. And you're in bondage, right? To, but to know Jesus, he would, he would love that person enough to tell them the truth. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to say yes or no, right? And, and so how does that all... How does that all fit together with, with the go is you have to go with knowing Jesus. Not just what you think you know or what or, or what the world will repackage and recharacterize and softenize him right no you got to go with the real jesus but you got to go i'm going to give another answer to your question to add to that if we don't go yes yes we would be called cowards and a coward a brave person let's start there a brave person in biblical terms is not someone that's just randomly fearless. It's that they fear God so much they don't fear anything else. And so they do things that You know, that's why we have these pieces of paper that I write. Does anybody remember that we should that, we should we should note that. That should be somewhere in a heading on a like a little slide. Can you say that again? We yeah. should we should fear <laughs> God. We should fear God so much that we don't fear anything else. And love him so much that we don't love anything else as much. Mm -hmm. And if that is driving you, you're going to do things you never thought you would ever, you would do and things that you actually know you cannot do. And when God says, well, I need you to do this because he said, so you believe that he's going to go with you and it will get done. You never get into thinking you have to do it yourself. If you know the Lord, you know he never, he's not that kind of a taskmaster that's just going to cut you loose and go, go figure it out, sink a swim, friend. He will go before you, all around you, behind you. And if you realize that, then you can overcome 
your fears that hold you back. And if you don't go, then the simple word for what happens is loss. You lose. You lose the battle. You lose your spoil. You lose your dreams. You lose your calling. You lose the face of God because you displease him. Fear displeases God because it makes us not pretty. We don't do the right things when we're afraid. Mm. And so it displeases God. Even when you think you have a reason to fear something, it still displeases God because it makes you disobey him. So you lose If you think about being in a group of people and someone is called to do something fearless, well, if they don't do it in in straight terms, some people will die. And it could be that person that didn't do what they should do might live, but precious people to them will die. Isaiah 57, is it not because I've withheld my anger of old that you don't fear me? And, and, it, and Joshua 1, when to go, again, contextualizing things, I will never leave you or forsake you. Yep. Right? And that's, that's, a, that's a theme throughout. I'll never leave you. So, so if we really know Jesus, know God, know the Holy Spirit, and we're willing to go, then we know that he's always with us. And, and if we're going based on what he's called us to do after we inquire, and he says, pursue, go, and you're afraid and, and you hold back, then, then you're gonna lose. Somebody's gonna get hurt, somebody's gonna die, or, or God, like David said last night, God, God's gonna take a, uh, a blessing, a ministry, or something from you. He's gonna take it away. He's like, no. He can't soft. trust you with it. He can't trust you. He can't you. trust you with it. He can't exactly. trust you. No. And the same thing with money. The same thing with believers with money who have come from nothing, who let's say you're a son of a butcher, just for example, and all of a sudden, you just, for example, you do this, or or let's say, you know, you're a son of a of a beer cooker, right? And he just have surrendered everything, you know. What else? What else? What other examples? Who else could your dad be? Let's go. I don't know. <laughs> Tree feller. I don't know, man. Tree feller. That's hard work, by the way. Tree feller. Oh, it's, it's not actually, easy. It's a, I wish I knew how yeah. to do it. Anyway, but that, but but God will trust you. Numbers There's money. Numbers thirty two. Yeah, it, it's. Numbers 32 was um, the three tribes that said, hey, we want to stay on this side of the Jordan, but we'll still go out and fight. And Moses says, okay, if you prepare yourself before the Lord for the war until the Lord has driven out his enemies from before him. You're like, wait a second. You said if we prepare ourselves for war before the Lord and we go out until the Lord has prevailed against his enemies. Wait, I thought the humans did. Humans do it and God takes credit. But if humans don't do it, what can God take credit for? Right. There's a there's the the eighty third episode will be the the juxtaposition <laughs> between 83rd? the soft pastors who never talk about battles or who say only say, Oh, God will fight we're your not, battle. We're not a cruise ship, we're a battleship. Or God will fight your battle. <laughs> and then the other guys say that you know, we gotta we gotta fight our own battles, but then never really go, but they just Go around a church like praying in tongues, rant and raving, and then never do anything. Right. So, so that's a juxtaposition. But the but the truth is that if you read those fifteen times in the Word where it says the Lord is going to fight for you, the Lord is going to fight your battle, that's what it says. That's the plain meaning. But then you again have to look at context. Remember our statutory construction principle: context. You got to go. You got to know. Please give me the you answer. gotta grow. You gotta grow. And you gotta mm, another O word. It's a. It was a good one. He's like so? mo. So mo. It was so. You do so much. Lacey, no. it was so right. No. It's like you gotta you gotta so you gotta same. go you gotta grow and you gotta know, right? I don't know what they order us, but that's what he showed me was the context. And so he does fight, but you gotta. You got to do all. You have to do all those things. You have to be willing to move out, and that's get. I guess that's another piece of the go. But Steve, what was your question? No, it's just it's just reality that even if you're told to go, right? Ultimately, again, that honor system is your is your system just of of being reprimanded or showing honor because the outcome is you go, God gets credit, God gets the glory. Yeah, and so it's like it's like God's 
it, it costs our God everything to love us. Mm-hmm. What does it cost us to love him back? And people are like, it shouldn't cost us anything. It actually should cost us. <laughs> like e- even even Whoa. even Luke gets into like, you know, Jesus saying, like, consider the cost. Does does a Count does the cost. D- does a man not consider the cost of building a house before he starts and realize that he he doesn't have enough? Or a king that has ten thousand soldiers goes out against another king that has more, does not consider the cost and then go and make peace. And so at some point, like it's supposed to cost us something, but if you never go, what does it cost you? You know, like, like not speaking enough Christianese to where other people might judge you for not being as Christian as everyone else. Like <laughs> that's not a cost. That's not real. That's 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 like play money. It's like monopoly money mm-hmm. in the big world. It's playing church, man. I hate playing church. What's your what's your you only got <clears throat> twelve fifty three. What what's your motivational statements to people? People or pastors or if they're out there. Like the other Charlie and the Bukins out there that, that are, you're trying to motivate them. Like, hey, even though, you know, you might have had an interesting run with church, you still are the church. You have to become the church. People worthy of a king's return. Mm-hmm. Like what season are you guys in with that? Because I think you, what you guys are on the outside is you're allowing God to speak through you. Yeah. And you're asking God to like, all right, position us. Right, so... For we we kind of hear the same thing, but the first is, I mean, the go initiative is based obviously on the call to go. We could spend an hour analyzing the go directive, the go mandate, and the context, but it's still there. The second element is immediacy. Immediacy in the book of Mark, the word immediately appears forty two times, and. I'm learning about numbers, but what I know, again, like in the baseball context, is what number was f- what's what what is the most important number? Forty two. Like who? What player wore forty two? The most two most important. Do you know? Mm-hmm. Jackie Robinson. I what, almost said that, but I, what you know, what what I what, does, what, what, what did the man's that. life stand for? Oh, he was breaking all the social Destroying norms. Destroying norms and barriers. Right. Yeah. Okay. So who, I, do you see the chills, Lacey? Mm-hmm. The last man to wear 42, Mariona Rivera. What does, what does his life stand for? Number one, all-time leader in saves. Mm-hmm. 602. Number two, the only man in the history of baseball to be elected unanimously to the Hall of Fame. Saves, unanimity, Unity, right? Saves unity, and now his and now his foundation that he has. And I want I, I I need to I need to connect with Mariano Rivera somehow because there's there's 20 different categories of revelation that I've seen that connect baseball to to the law. But anyway, it's 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 the call to go. It's the immediacy. Um, it's understanding. The beggars and 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 Jesus compassion. It's uh and, and it's understanding what your what your name means and what these you know, I don't want to oversay this, but the man all the calling or whatever, but understand what your name is, right? I understand what your name is and and get to it. But but getting to it, like we don't know how. We try inside, I do it in the gym all the time, I do it with my clients. Um, we're also gonna we're also gonna do something, the four of us. And uh, Lacey, you like names, and so Holy Spirit told me that this is going to be called JC Four Consulting, Jesus and C Four, the Power of Dynamite. No Jesus, so JC Four Consulting. We're going to put out of business life coaches who are soft and just throw you a little life raft and say, "Keep coming back." We're going to teach people the word and set them free. Business executives. That's what we're going to do. Love it. All right. Amen. So those are some of the goes, but to encourage people, it's like you have a go, figure out what it is, and then and then find find your find your people around you who are willing who are willing to go. And just do it. Never forget who God says you are. Never measure that by what the numbers are saying, your achievements and your turnover or any of that. I just see too many people that are just hungry for God and desire to please him. And 
the devil can really get in there and mess with you and make you a beast of burden where you're just, you start to count your deeds and think that that's who you are when you are a child of God. And the reason why you have the call is because you're a child of God, you get to do those things. You don't become more of a child of God because you do those things. So it's really important to never forget who you are in God and who God says you are. And also be awake. I've been hearing this a lot. Be awake, be awake, be awake. Don't be, it's not the same as being paranoid. It's being aware because you have an enemy and you are constantly walking in unfriendly territories and yet walk you must. So be awake and trust God to sharpen your senses and hear him and be sensitive. The more sensitive and obedient you are, the more your senses are going to operate under the Holy Spirit Amen. and keep you safe. And, and, and to close it out, uh, if, you, if you listen to podcasts, that's great. My encouragement, I'm begging you, like you will not understand or have the type of revelation that you might want until you open the word and be hungry for it. Not, not in an obligatory way, not in a religious way, but just be hungry for it. It's like, goodness gracious, this God's still talking to me, right? This is what the Holy Spirit is relieving, is re revealing to me. And then if you look at some cool number collections, just for like my last thing, to encourage people to get in the word every single day, every single day, Luke 445577. I live by every word of God. At your word, I will. So Peter said, I will drop down the nets. But at your word, I will. And say the word, and my servant will be healed. Okay? So I live by every word of God. At your word, I will. And say the word. Okay? Beautiful. You want to close it out in prayer? Sure. Who's praying? Can you pray? Okay, hallelujah. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who we are in you. Thank you for the wonder of, of the cross. Thank you for letting your son come to us and, and be crucified and shed his blood and cleanse our sin and rise again so that we can live forever. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for every moment that we get to breathe and have another opportunity to find out your will and obey you. And thank you for illuminating us. Thank you for the mind of Christ. And as we separate right now, Lord, we do not separate from you. We choose to abide with you and in you. And we trust you and entrust to you every single dream and call and idea that you give us. And we ask humbly for more ideas. We ask for more wisdom from you, the wisdom that is only from you. And we ask that you teach us more and more the fear of you and continue to bless Bless us with your protection and surround us with your favor as with a shield and surround our families also. We ask this and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Episode one. In the books. The doctor in the Dude. chisel. Doctor on the chisel. Yeah. Right? That's wow. That's a real deal right there. Amen. I mean, this is something. So all right. Well, I guess we can call you from the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call us in the car. Right? Thank you very much for doing this. This is awesome. Of course. Talking about. Thank you, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, that officially wraps up episode one of Dr. Owen the Chisel featuring Charlie and the Buchan Arts. We had the pleasure of recording them last Saturday, July 13th in their home in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And God willing, that was the first of many. It is currently 2.45 in the morning, Thursday, July 18th. I am about to leave the studio and go assault the gates of hell on a little patch of concrete that I've uh, carved out for myself and that God says, listen, this is where we embark and do the things and do the prayers. But as for you and your house, I pray that you were blessed and edified. I pray that you forward this on. I pray that you learn things, that you were equipped. And of all things, I pray that Christ himself is speaking to you directly. The Holy Spirit is connecting dots. Listen, no matter who you are, where you are, you're not too far gone. If you're hearing my voice, that means there's still time. I don't know how much time. Things are getting weird. People are taking shots. I'm just saying. Now, 
If you want to reach us, have any thoughts, questions, concerns, comments, junk mail, you know, whatever you got, visit us online at www.forth.watch, F-O-U-R-T-H dot watch, or on patreon.com at the fourth watch or slash the fourth watch. Join us on Instagram, TikTok, all the uh, the usual social places. But as for, uh, you know, us and ours, we are hoping to bring you more episodes. This is the first episode for them and probably the reboot for our podcast. We can't tell what you guys want. Audio, video, reels, shorts. We're just trying to give it all. Anyways, God bless, God speed. Get in the word, get on your feet, and get in the fight. We've got work to do. See ya.